Well, we are so thankful to God that we are able to come into His presence, and we are so grateful for His blessings and the right and the privilege that we have to worship Him and to study from His Word. And as we get into our study, as we have been in this series of lessons, looking at the prophecies, some of the prophecies that foretold of the coming of the everlasting messianic kingdom and that would that it would come in the last days in this time period known as the last days and in our previous lessons we have identified that this period of time is not the period of time that we are living in today well, why do i say that because jesus said the law and the prophets were until john since that time the kingdom of god is preached now notice and every man presses into it so the kingdom had to be in existence prior to uh, Pentecost, as most people try to force uh, Mark 9 and verse 1 to mean. But this kingdom was foretold that it was going to come in the last days. And Paul wrote to the Hebrews, and he said, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto uh, the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son and so when we consider that the time frame in which jesus spoke unto us by his son to which paul refers then that cannot be the last days of the christian age that has to be referring to when jesus was on earth and so the last days began during the ministries of john john the baptizer and jesus and Paul went on to write in Hebrews 9, verse 26, and he said, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, cosmos, but now, once in the end of the ages, he has appeared, Fainaru, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Well, Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, and verse 20, for, and I'm referring to Christ, and says that he was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, Vainaru, he was manifest in these last times for you. And so again, this time frame, this time period in which Jesus appeared and, and, and his sacrifice, well, that was not in the end of the Christian age, but it was in the end of the age. So this has to be referring to the end of the Jewish age, so the Mosaic age. And then again, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he told them there in chapter 10 of uh, a lot of the things that befell the children of Israel in the wilderness because of their disobedience. And, and he showed how that God punished them. And he said, all these things, and this is verse 11, he said, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition up on whom the ends of the ages have arrived. They are come. And so again, same concept. They were living then in this time frame of the last days. <coughs> and again, because... It's inescapable that this period began with the preaching of John and Jesus and that that's, that inaugurated the kingdom. Then the Christian age cannot be the last days. And so in this time frame and pointing to this time frame, there were promises. God made promises, prophecies. He made promises to his people in through the through the. Uh, prophets through the Hebrew prophets and he promised that he was going to create a new people there was going to be a new tabernacle there was going to be a new covenant and this new covenant would be an everlasting covenant and it would be a covenant wherein sin would be remitted it would be forgotten and not be remembered anymore and it would be un again unlike just like the kingdom it would be unlike any covenant that had ever existed uh, from the dawn of time he was going to create a new heavens and a new earth he was going to create a new Jerusalem. And this, this new world, this new age, would be the age of everlasting righteousness. And again, Paul said in Ephesians 3 and verse 21, that uh, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Age without end. And so the Christian age has no end. And 
again, in looking at these promises, then there was the promise of judgment, the judgment of Old Covenant Israel. There was the promise of resurrection, resurrection of Israel. And this would be at the parousia of Christ. And again, these are promises, and we've looked at that from Daniel 7, which was the only prophecy of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with the angels for the opening of the book's judgment. And, you know, Paul said that uh, his hope was the hope of Israel, Acts 26 and verse 6. And he, he, he go on down in that chapter to verse 22 there, and then he is talking about uh, resurrection, and that he, his, his uh, doctrine of the resurrection and the coming of Christ is taken directly from Moses and the prophets. And again, these were promises that were made to the fathers. And that's what, that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 8 there. He said and talked about the promise of adoption. And he said, goes on and says then, in, and uh, we'll look at that here in just a minute. Um, but when we think about uh, the promise of resurrection, and what I'm trying to do is I want to, to do a little bit of preliminary groundwork, if you want to use that term, and uh, for, for uh, as we approach uh, the, the study of the resurrection. Because this was one of the promises that God had made. There was a promise of the second coming. There was a promise of judgment. There was the promise of resurrection. And, and again, the only thing you don't find promise of in the Old Testament to Israel was the end of material creation because that's not there. He's talking about the end of the age, their age, the end of the Jewish world, which would lead and step into the Messianic, the everlasting kingdom age. And so, again, as we have looked at Daniel 2, Daniel 7 in the last study, or excuse me, Daniel 9 in the last study, also we've looked at Daniel 7 and Daniel 12, and all these prophecies that were foretelling the coming of this new kingdom that would bring in everlasting righteousness, and it would usher in this judgment and this resurrection of the just and the unjust, and this was posited in the time frame of the abomination of desolation and the great tribulation that Jesus quoted and applied and said that it would be fulfilled in his generation. Now, what I want to look at is uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20. And again, uh, I'm wanting to look at some concepts because as we study, as we study uh, the, the topic, the subject of eschatology, and you have these uh, elements of the second coming, the judgment, the resurrection. Well, as you study, th especially through uh, the Gospels and then into uh, some of the epistles, we find these themes or motifs, if we want to use that word. And, and for instance, the Lord coming in judgment, well, we have the theme or the motif of Him coming like a thief. And we had, we, you can find various places where uh, it's being spoken of him coming like a thief. And so we have to respect the analogies, the parabolic language that is being used. Uh, speaking of the coming, uh, the second coming, there is the motif of the wedding. And when we talk about the second coming and the resurrection and even the judgment, we have the motif of the harvest, the theme of the harvest. And there is so much harvest language that is used and analogies that is used in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even in the epistles. And you know, even in our songbook, we have songs that have that uh, theme in them of harvest. And so, when we look at First uh, Corinthians 15 and verse 20, where Paul says, "But now is Christ risen from the dead," and again, that is out from the dead (plural, dead ones) out from the dead ones. It says, and become the first fruits of them that slept. Well, this term, first fruits, is a harvest imagery, okay? Because uh, under the law of Moses, they had those feasts. And the feast of uh, harvest, they, they had the feast of harvest, 
But see, when they would go out and begin to gather, so there's another term, another harvest language term, when they would go, go out and begin to gather their crop, then they would make an offering of first fruits. And so Paul uses this analogy or this motif, if you will, of Christ that he is the first fruits out from the dead. And so when we look at, um, and of course he, he, he says that again in verse 23, and, but when we look at Acts 26 and verse 23, it says here that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. Again, that's out from the dead ones. Should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And so Christ being referred to as first fruits, this is, and, and Acts 26 here shows that, that, and again, this is in the context of Paul's hope being the hope of Israel and the resurrection. Again, uh, verse 22, let's look at that. Verse 22 is where he says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and he'd show light to the people and to the Gentiles. So again, this term and, and Paul referring to Christ as first fruits, well, Christ actually was the first, first fruit, if you want to look at it that way, because he was the first that, that arose out from the dead ones. Now, another point, and we'll probably come back to this again in later studies, another point is this cannot be referring to his physical resurrection, just like we studied in a previous lesson, looking at Romans chapter 6, that people were being baptized into his death. Well, they weren't being baptized into his physical death, and they weren't arising in physical life out of physical death. Paul is using figurative language, spiritual language. And again, we have to compare spiritual with spiritual. And so Christ was the first one to exodus, and again, you, you find that term in uh, the transfiguration language there, Matthew 17, uh, Mark 9, and Luke 9. And so he was the first one to make his exodus out of Hades. Okay, again, he didn't, the, the focus is not on Jesus, his body coming out of the tomb, because that's not the language because there were no other dead people, dead bodies in that tomb with Jesus. So if Jesus arose out from the dead, the plural, then it's inescapable that Paul is referring to Christ making his exodus out of Hades. And he was the first one to do that. And he was the first one to arise into this new body, this new body, uh, the corporate body of Christ. And again, he was first fruits. And so... Again, in thinking about the term first fruits, it is because we, through the decades, have not studied this language. We have not studied the Jewish feasts. We have not studied the Old Testament, the background for Paul's teaching. Then we have missed what this term means, what it refers to. And because of that, then man, we have... Uh, generally, typically, we have approached this and thinking, well, you know, Christ was the first to arise from the dead, never to die again. Again, that's still thinking of bi biological, physical death. And that is not the focus. And I'm going to show you why I say that. When we look at 1 Corinthians 16, next chapter, and verse 15, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, you know that the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Well see here is a household of people and Paul is referring to uh, some who he baptized and uh, I think he says that in chapter 1 actually of 1 Corinthians that he, he himself had not baptized very many people but the house of Stephanus was one of those instances where he did. But 
notice that he calls living, breathing human beings first fruits. Okay? And then again, when we look at Romans 16 and verse 5, Paul says there uh, to them, likewise, greet the church that is in their house, and that's Ananias and Sapphira. Greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. And so it is generally believed that this person is, was of the household of Stephanus, okay? And that's how that Paul could say, well, Epinetus was the first fruits, whereas the household of Stephanus, they are first fruits. But again, Here's another instance where we have a living, breathing human being who is called first fruits. This harvest language. All right, again, when we look at James 1 and verse 18, and now remember, James is writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Verse 1. In verse 18, he says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, James, is writing to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. They weren't dead. They were living, breathing human beings, and there was a bunch of them. And he calls them a kind of first fruits. All right, then we can look at Revelation 14, where it uh, speaks of the 144,000 taken from the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And it says in verse 4, when John asks, you know, who are these? And the answer is, they, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now here we have an instance of and I, this is a figurative number. It's a representative number. The 144,000, it represented the saved out of 12 tribes of Israel. But these were souls. These were dead people. Okay? They had not been resurrected. Okay? And they are called first fruits unto God. So again, when we, again, allowing the Bible to, to interpret itself, allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture, we can see that these writers are using harvest imagery, harvest language. And these, the, the Epinetus and the household of Stephanus and the 12 tribes of Israel and these souls of the 144,000, these were first fruits unto God this is referring and demonstrating that the harvest had begun. Do we get that point? The harvest is not something yet in our future. The harvest was the gathering of Israel. Okay? Because again, when you look at Revelation 14, he sees the 144,000. He's told these are the first fruits unto God. Then he sees another multitude of people that he can't number. And those are the they that came out of great tribulation. But these specific uh, 144,000 representative of the 12 tribes of Israel, okay, they are called first fruits also. And so, uh, as I said, we, we mentioned Romans 8, where he refers to the adoption. He says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. See that? Even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption the redemption of our body again notice the plural pronoun and the singular subject our plural singular body and so and again i don't know anybody that doesn't understand this passage to be referring to resurrection i talked to a brother just a couple days ago and that's that's what he agreed he agreed this is referring to resurrection the adoption well, when we go to chapter 9, then we find out that this promise that Paul is referring to here of the adoption, that this was a promise made to the fathers. For I could wish myself 
excuse me, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom, that's the Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Notice that. These promises that Paul is referring, that doesn't mean there's not other promises. But the promises that Paul has in mind here of the adoption, the resurrection, these were promises that pertained to the fathers, to Israel. All right, he says, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, again, Paul said, Christ came to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And he says, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. That as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Again, prophecy had said that all Israel would be saved. But again, in studying that, that would be through the remnant, the election. And again, that goes back to the harvest language of the gathering. Matthew 24, uh, 30 and 31. Uh, they would see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Uh, all the tribes of the earth would mourn. And he says, and he'll send his angels and they'll gather together his elect. Okay, that's the remnant. And that's what Jesus said would be fulfilled in the generation which would witness the raising of the uh, Jewish temple. And so he says, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children but in Isaac. So again, here is the contrast of the two covenants, the contrast of uh, the physical versus the promise. The promise was through Isaac. And again, that's what Paul teaches in Galatians 4 in his allegory there, which we have studied. And he says, But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Now notice that. These are not the children of God. That's why... Jesus said in Matthew 8, uh, verse 11 or so there, that the children, the sons of the kingdom, would be cast out. Okay? And uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll uh, look at that in our upcoming studies as we go on speaking of resurrection. These, that's the children of the flesh. That's, that's uh, fleshly Israel. The Jews who are rejecting the gospel. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And again, that's what Paul teaches in Galatians chapter 3, the end of the chapter there and in chapter 4. And then in Romans 11 and verse 16, again, we have this first fruit analogy where Paul says, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And uh, this, uh, this has to deal with uh, when they would make a, uh, a loaf of bread and they had the lump of the bread dough. They would squeeze off a small portion of that. And, they, and uh, I actually had a reference here. Uh, let's see. Let's look at that. And that is in Numbers 15, verse 18. Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land, whither I bring you, then it shall be that when you eat of the bread of the land, you shall offer up a heave offering unto the Lord. You shall offer up a cake of the first, there's the first fruit, see, of the first of your dough for a heave offering. And as you do the heave offering of the threshing floor, so shall you heave it. Of the first of your dough, you shall give unto the Lord an heave offering in your generations. And so again, this is what Paul is referring to here in Romans chapter 11 and verse 16. And so he is... He is demonstrating here the salvation of Israel, the casting off of Israel, and the salvation of the Gentiles. And that's what he's teaching here in this chapter. And it is with this first fruit, this harvest uh, 
analogy. And so again, and that's, I'm going to save that because that's what I want to look at in the next study is Romans chapter 11. But what I want, again, thinking about when Paul used the term first fruits there in 1 Corinthians 15, and let's go back there. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse uh, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So again, this is harvest analogy. And we remember Genesis 49.10 where Jacob, Israel, was telling his sons what would befall them when? In the last days. And he said there, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Gathering. There's the harvest language. And uh, again, uh, when we look at uh, Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 6, that is exactly, I'm not going to take the time to read that, but go there, read that text again, Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 6, and that's where God told them that they would become so wicked, and this would be in their latter times, their latter end, their, the latter days, they would become so wicked that He would scatter them, but He would regather them. And he would circumcise their hearts. And that's what we find Paul teaching in his ministry. This circumcision of the heart. So again, go there and read that. And he says there in that text of Deuteronomy that uh, he would gather them from the uttermost parts under heaven whether they would be scattered. Well, that's exactly what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse recorded in Mark's record that he would gather them from the utmost parts of the, of the earth, the uttermost parts of heaven. He would gather them. That, that would be those angels that he would send to gather together the elect. And so again, we have that harvest language. Okay? And see, we find, we find Jesus talking about this in Matthew uh, chapter 13 in a parable. And I want to take just a minute to look at that before we close. In Matthew 13, he gives the parable of the... Uh, uh, tares, the wheat and the tares. Okay, they come, the disciples come to him later and ask him to explain what that parable meant. They didn't understand that parable. So he explains it to them. Uh, so the parable, he gives the parable in uh, Matthew 13, verse 24. Then beginning in verse 37, verse 36 says, Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. His disciples came to him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. They didn't understand that parable. So he answered them and said, He that sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. Now, that, again, this is King James. When you look at the original language, that is the end of the age. And we'll just... We'll look at New King James to show you that. The harvest is the end of the age. Okay? That's a suntily a ho a honion uh, there in, in the Greek. The end of the age. That's not the end of the cosmos. He even uses the word cosmos in this text. The field is the world. World. That's cosmos right there. Verse 38. That is not what he's saying here. That the harvest is the end of the world. Or he would use the same word right there in the same breath. And the fact that he uses a different word proves that he is not speaking of the end of the world. He's speaking of the end of the age. Okay, now, he says, The enemy that sowed him is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, and that's what he told in the parable, that when the worker said, Well, do you want us to go out there and pull up the tares? He said, No, lest you uproot the wheat also. Let them both grow together, and then when you get ready to harvest, uh, gather them all, separate them, and burn the tares. Gather the wheat into the barn. And so, again, he is explaining what he meant by the parable. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Okay? That's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He'll send his angels, and they'll gather, it's harvest language, to gather the elect. Therefore, 
as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of this age. Notice that. So shall it be at the end of this age. So he is specific. This age. That is a demonstrative pronoun and he is referring to the age that he's living in. I mean, that's, that's basic grammar. And then he says, the Son of Man will send out his angels. Again, Matthew 24, 31. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So again, notice that in this harvest language, in the gathering, in the resurrection, in the judgment, and all of those concepts are in this parable. That there's good and bad. We have to understand that. Okay? When the second coming would occur, when the judgment would occur, when the resurrection would occur, there's a good side and a bad side. Those that have done evil, that would be the tares, they would be cast into the furnace of fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth while the righteous, that would be the good wheat gathered into the barn, the good wheat would be gathered into the kingdom. And he says in verse 43 then, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And this is taken from Daniel 12 and verse 3. Here when he says, and so we'll just we'll go there and look at that. Daniel 12 and verse 3. And this is when he said, uh, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So there's the judgment. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt, shame and contempt. So again, there's the resurrection, there's the good and the bad. Okay? Now notice verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So again, there is what Jesus is drawing from in this uh, parable here in Matthew 13 and verse 43. And so, again, we have this harvest language. And so, again, as we uh, prepare to uh, in, in involve ourselves in the study of resurrection, we want to be looking at how the Bible, how the Scriptures define these promises and how the Scriptures define this language, this harvest language of gathering of first fruits and uh, uh, just whatever that we look at in this theme of harvest, the harvest language and being gathered. And so um, I wanted to look at that and, and, and consider these words, these terms, uh, of particularly first fruits and how it is used in various places and in every place uh, it is in, in every other place other than Christ, it is not referring to resurrection from physical death. While many of the, of the people, they were still living, and then even souls who had not been resurrected, but they are called first fruits. And so, again, allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture, this shows us that the harvest had begun, and these these uh, the Jews that were uh, obeying the gospel even from uh, the very beginning of John's ministry when he would preach repent and be baptized because the, for the remission of sins because the kingdom is at hand those Jews who would do that then their sins were remitted right well they were already children of God so that's why Jesus could say those who did that they had passed from death into life. That's resurrection. There is no better definition of resurrection than a transition out of death into everlasting life. And that's what Jesus taught. That's what He said. John 5, 
verses 24 and following. That's what Jesus said. And he used present tense language showing that the resurrection, the harvest, the gathering was already, it had already begun. And it would go through a period of time and then at the end of the age, and again, Matthew 8, when Jesus said that the children of the kingdom will be cast out, that is when all the righteous in Hades would be, they'd make their transition into the everlasting kingdom because Christ's blood would flow backward and cleanse all those sins. And they, re, they would receive their redemption because he was coming, bringing redemption. And just like the high priest who would take the blood of the lamb, go into the, the most holy place and make that offering, then he would come out as on the day of atonement. He would come out of the temple, out of the tabernacle and tell the people the sacrifice is accepted. Their sins will be rolled forward. Jesus' blood, same, and, and that was a type that foreshadowed the sacrifice of Christ, the perfect lamb. And that's what they were all waiting for. They were held under darkness for all those millennia, all those centuries. And so when Christ came, he offered himself a sacrifice. Hebrews 9.26, we just read. He entered the most holy place with his own blood, and, he, and they were waiting for him to return, bringing redemption. Hebrews 10, verse 37. He that would come shall come in a very, very little while. He will come and not tarry. Now that's, that's what the Bible says. That's what the text says. You can read that for yourself. So anyway, I want to just kind of get a preliminary, uh, a little bit of groundwork here as we begin to approach uh, the study of resurrection. And so then with these thoughts then, we will uh, close our study for this morning.